Hey, listeners, if you haven't joined Stitcher Premium yet, now's the perfect time. Stitcher Premium gets you completely ad-free episodes of hundreds of shows like Comedy Bang Bang, WTF with Mark Marin, and How Did This Get Made? You'll also get 21,000 hours of exclusive content. New exclusive originals like Marvel's Wolverine and Issa Rae's Fruit are launching every week for Stitcher Premium members. If you love podcasts, you are missing out. When you listen to ad-free episodes in Stitcher Premium, your favorite podcasters get paid. Help support your favorite shows and join Stitcher Premium today. For a free month of listening, go to stitcherpremium.com and use promo code POCKET. Once again, stitcherpremium.com, promo code POCKET, and we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly. <sighs> All right. We are live. Another heavy news week. Some really cool Google and Android news. ZTE is in bad shape following U.S. import bans. We're pretty confident that we'll see a Pixel smartwatch this fall. Net neutrality inches one step closer to actual death. And we've been digging into the announcements at Google I.O., taking a look at Android P previews. We've got a lot to talk about, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 304 of the Pocket Now Weekly. Recorded May 11th at 10 a.m. Pacific, this weekly podcast is where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and the smartest watch on the playground was really just a calculator. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, contributing editor at PocketNow.com, joined as always by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong on the East Coast. And I think we're both, even though we're bi-coastal, sharing some allergy histamine Have you seen the video where... Like there's a backhoe uh, crashing <laughs> yes, into a tree. I know exactly what you're talking about. And the pollen just goes just all lost. crazy. Up, it, it's a cloud. <laughs> like that's that's. Oh boy. I, I, that's I don't not... believe there is a hell, but if there is a hell, that's that's what I'm surrounded by. I mean, it's not I'm fire working... and brimstone, and it's freaking trees <laughs> it's full of pollen. Right. It's my, my personal hell is the happening, but not where I go suicidal because of the plants. Just just normal plants. Just normal well, plants. And that's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the nasal passages over here are kind of uh, suffering. So I apologize if I sound a little more stuffy than I usually do. I'm all I'm very stuffy usually, but this time around I'm stuffy extra here. stuffy. Right. And tell me last night if you had the same thing where I was like, I would roll over and feel one nostril clear and the other clog. And like, uh, oh, sweet relief. Then I'd roll back over in the middle of the night. <laughs> very unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I have to rely on my apron to uh, help me out in that respect. Um, well, it's sad. Well, we're not going to we're gonna, not going to focus too much on our biological deficiencies when it comes to. <laughs> the material plants make and eject into the air you know, weaker members of the species we probably would have been bred out of existence if we were more darwinian uh we've got <laughs> some some great stories to talk about there's there's a ton of news going on actually some some pretty uh mobile focused politics that we're gonna have to take a look at and of course google io uh all of the big announcements coming from uh the developer conference uh and and the the android p developer preview we've been taking a look at here at pocket now jules why don't we jump in with some of the headlines and then we'll we'll focus the second half of the show all on uh io and android p well i just wanted to mention that uh oh, yeah. you you the viewer the listener can also join in on the conversation too by hopping onto twitter and uh joining in with uh uh, tagging your message or questions with hashtag PN Weekly, and we'll be able to track these comments in real time as they come along. And uh, if uh, you have questions but you can't ask them live, well, you can send an email to us at uh, podcast at pocketnow.com, and we'll be able to get to those uh, every end of the month. So uh, do that. Do the Twitter thing. If you're on YouTube, we'll try and get to the chat over there. Uh, it's just going to be a great uh, conversation that we're going to have. Yeah, it's always good times. And, and uh, we already have a, a tweet coming in from uh, from Andrew Sislak. Is this a permanent change to 1 p.m. Eastern? And just a couple little scheduling issues that we had uh, last week with Nick Gray, this week with myself and some uh, some projects that I'm working on. I so, like to say uh, that all, all of these podcasts are happening at special times. It's yeah. always it's it doesn't matter when it's happening. It's just a special time. We have scientifically determined the exact right time to podcast these new stories and these tech topics. 
And uh, well, next, let's just <laughs> next week it could be like four in the afternoon. You know, you don't know. That's why you've got to you've got to could keep be a four a.m. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Four four a.m. Uh, Singapore time could be the exact right time to talk about next week's news stories. It could be. I, I, I'm I'm going to uh, keep like derailing the show if we don't get to the news. Yeah, well, yeah, let's uh, let's talk it. about let's just go through it one by one because uh, there are four big stories that I think really poked out. Uh, in terms yeah, I'm going uh, to share the uh, the Pocket Now uh, website here while we do that. Yeah, affecting the industry going on here. So uh, ZTE has announced uh, through uh, stock exchange filings that it has basically ceased all major operations and uh, they're still uh, getting their workers to work. Uh, they don't have much to do, apparently, according to uh, sources to Reuters. And that, uh, I was just covering this this morning, so I'm sorry that you'll have to... Um, switch over but telstra from australia uh, as a result of these uh cessations has uh, announced that it will stop carrying zte phones at least mm -hmm. temporarily so uh this is a uh, big news 19 smartphones three mobile hotspot devices pulled from store shelves and uh, just uh it could roll on into other regions. So um, what do you think uh, at this point? Because ZT has said previously that this would be a uh, dangerous, uh, a death knell to its uh, uh, company. And this, again, all stems from an imports ban uh, issued by the U.S. Commerce uh, Department. Yeah, I mean, the for the entire organization, top to bottom, this is this is a disastrous turn of events. I mean, originally when we were covering some of the uh, the first law enforcement advisories, I, I think for myself personally, and and for a lot of the people that are listening to our show or watching our show, we were probably focused more on the the consumer facing handset market. Um, I just I was very much anticipating an Axon 9 this year uh, after spending some time with the Axon M and how much of a fan I was of the Axon 7. So, I mean, initially it was like, oh, well, that's a bummer. We're not going to get a phone. And then it just seems like with every every successive story that's come out reporting on the state of ZTE, it, it's like a new economic impact, a new trade impact. Another partner falls falls by the wayside. And I, I think this is one of those areas we want to be real careful because how law enforcement can act and how punitive some of these uh, penalties are for engaging in business practices, which the United States is, is currently frowning on. Uh, we definitely want to be cognizant of that. But then also, I, I question whether or not we should be looking at business practices that completely eradicate a company and whether or not ZTE can actually walk itself back from, from the brink on this or if it's going to be able to find alternative manufacturing partners outside of the United States, that's still going to be such a substantial hit to the company that now we're just going to be playing the game to see if they can recover at all, or if this is going to be a company that's carved up for parts and patents in the next year or two. Because it's not just smartphones. They also do a lot of uh, telecommunications Wait, there, equipment. You, you said it before. I've, I'm sorry. I've completely forgotten. They're the number four in the uh, sector for telecommunications infrastructure could be number four uh, but the, one of the top ones i guess but uh it, it, they they are far behind huawei but uh yeah they're still a major player out there and that's where most of their business is held not in smartphones but in yeah. uh telecom equipment so uh, and they rely on U.S. parts for those items as well. Uh, it's somewhat concerning to see that uh, these actions are are having this much of an effect. Uh, I know that they have said that this uh, has basically stopped them from doing anything that is, uh, you know. Well, the, the headline of the article we wrote up is actually kind of funny, though. ZTE employees reporting to work have nothing to do. And yeah. I mean, like, it's it's gallows humor, but I mean, that is kind of a sad state of affairs. What I'll be curious to see now is, do we think that our current Justice Department and the investigations surrounding Huawei are going to lead to similar uh, import bans and trade sanctions? Um, and again, I'm, I'm putting on a tinfoil hat here, but it makes me concerned to see our law enforcement agencies uh, responding to these kinds of situations. I mean, they should be responding with punitive actions. 
but I, I don't know that I completely believe that they should be so punitive that the companies are absolutely wrecked in in the following actions uh, after you know law enforcement gets involved for this. Well, they see this as issuing uh, issuing denial orders, issuing these import bans as one of the tools that they have and one of the most effective tools to you know address these concerns about national security uh, and. Again, especially in this administration, in the, in the Trump administration, where tensions and trade and other topics such as cybersecurity have been very strained between uh, the U.S. and China, uh, where Donald Trump has voiced very uh, voracious support in favor of a trade war with China. Uh, this is uh, just one of the complicating factors in the overall characteristic of our relationship, uh, and it's it's not really going to change. This is this is one of the symptoms, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there, and and I, I think it's probably going to get uglier on all fronts, both political and business, corporate, um, hostile actions taken by a number of different interests involved. It's just, um, I, again, I, I that that little spark of of is is this fair play and and because we're not being given enough information at the consumer level and i, I mean like our, our show probably could file a freedom of information <laughs> act request yeah. for for more info on on what it is what exactly is is uh, transpiring between these countries and uh, these countries and these companies uh it, it it's still kind of it, it makes me anxious it makes me anxious that we're wielding this kind of influence without delivering evidence as to what the actual transgressions might have been. And, and again, I'll be very curious to see how this befalls Huawei. Now, Huawei, I think, is the next company that DOJ has in their sights. And if we see something similar, I'll, I'll, I'll be very concerned over what happened with ZTE, because I don't even think that ZTE's major sin was the, uh, the business they were doing with Iran. It was not complying completely with the original penalties that were laid forth for ZTE, the executives who were supposed to see jail time, the fines, the penalties, and, and how they were continuing to do business after the fact. Now, let's say Huawei is, is implicated in similar business practices up front. Are they going to be given the opportunity to comply with the original slate of penalties that ZTE faced? Or are we, again, going to go straight to some kind of sledgehammer style ban and and that's where I don't have a lot of confidence in this current administration to act with proportion to the actual uh, crimes involved. Yeah, ZTE had alleged its second, crimes. Sorry. Yeah, ZTE had its second chance, and apparently it broke that. But uh, whether the whatever litigation or investigation that the Justice Department wants to go against Huawei that is being reported at this point. Uh, that may or may not uh, be more stricter as the Justice Department tends to really lay down a hammer more than uh, the Commerce Department. Now, uh, before, let, before we yeah. move on, this is actually a pretty good question, and I just want to get your opinion on this, Jules. Uh, this is from Renato Laporte using the PN Weekly hashtag. Uh, my biggest question, what will happen to companies that have ZTE products deployed everywhere? If ZTE, if ZTE goes wrecked, our EKT, uh, this will be such a pain <laughs> in the butt. And I would imagine, and I don't know if if, if you would if, if you you would agree with this, I would imagine that if ZTE goes bust, it is just like craters, that ZTE's infrastructure is going to get carved up and sold to other companies. So that infrastructure is going to be sold off, managed, and deployed, further deployed by other existing players in this space. It would make sense to me that it's not just going to leave infrastructure high and dry. It's just going to be a little kind of shell game of moving parts and pieces around until everything gets sold off. Well, let's talk about the short term. I mean, they still have the resources and the people and their current assets to be able to supply support to existing infrastructure and existing clients. Uh, but as we go further and further along, if we find that there is a deterioration in ZTE state, uh, then well, I guess already people, if people are watching the news and people are, able to budget out any potential moves that they want to make well you know maybe a month or two from now would be the time to do so but in 
until that happens and in, you know in the cases where people aren't allowed by one way or another to make these certain changes in their systems uh, what we what we might see is a kind of a crisis situation of uh, just being able to find uh, other vendors other gap um, measures that they can take yeah. uh, already ZTE has trouble finding uh, gap uh, vendors and uh, other suppliers for what it wants to do as a business uh, Taiwan has uh, ordered an, uh, basically uh, this order that prevents all manufacturers from shipping to ZTE unless they get a, an exports uh, permit and uh, it sounds like other businesses and other governments are expressing just general skepticism in addition to uh, just uh, their practices, but also just their viability from all of this pressure. So, yeah, yeah it's a, I, kind I, of I a wonder, crutch situation. There's the cynic in me, too, that wonders, like, what if you just gutted ZTE and sold off all of the parts to another corporation like TZE and you just changed up some <laughs> of the board of directors you know like what Cambridge Analytica shuttered all their offices but not really because uh, Emmer data is going to be taking over for monitoring all of your Facebook activity I, I would like there's that part of me that that hilariously like maybe that would be a way around it's totally it's different possible. company it's a completely different company where, I mean, we bought all of the parts of ZTE and we restructured and we've got a new CEO. And so everything's kosher. Now. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, Chinese government, very protective of uh, its industries and its players. It wants to see them succeed. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's totally possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's true. I mean, it, it, I think it, it might have happened before and it could happen I'm again. Sure it has. Yeah, uh, let's move on to Google, but not I.O. We got some uh, future to talk about here uh, with the fall hardware event that they've made a tradition for the past several years. Apparently, uh, in addition to a Pixel 3, Pixel 3 XL smartphone, and uh, also uh, second generation Pixel Buds. Apparently, those will be coming back all new and improved, but it's unclear uh, what those improvements will be. Uh, we're talking about a uh, Pixel Watch, not an LG watch uh, style or, or you know, uh, something like that that seems Nexus-like but isn't. Uh, we're talking about a full-on Pixel Watch, and three of them, according to uh, Win Future and uh, Roland Quant, uh, it seems like uh, we'll be looking for Ling, Triton, and Sardine for uh, these code names that are coming up here. Uh, and all of them, as per Google, are referring to fish because, uh, I don't know, they, they like their fish over there. <laughs> uh, it will apparently uh, be sporting, they will be, apparently be sporting new Qualcomm Snapdragon Wear 3100 processors. And uh, he digs into uh, the main parts of it. Uh, not much change from the 28 nanometer Cortex A7 yeah. cores on the 2100, but it will have all the radio su uh, suites, uh, GPS, Wi Fi, LTE with VO LTE support, uh, Bluetooth, the AVPTX uh, codec support. And uh, he also goes into uh, why this uh, project has been delayed. Um, apparently, there was a contractor that was uh, commissioned for uh, test samples, and they were apparently not up to snuff. And uh, there was also the fact that Qualcomm has been uh, struggling to make these improvements to its processor, specifically in power management, uh, which will be one of the key pillars in bringing the 3100 up from the 2100. So, um, yeah, this is a uh, this is uh, something that we can uh, keep watch on, um, literally. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the I don't know because. L like we don't consider LG to be uh, Google and LG have had a long standing relationship in yeah. terms of building these products and uh, being together on uh, even the Pixel the Pixel 2 XL but mm -hmm. um what I don't know what's happening here and I don't know if uh, this stands as a a challenge to Apple Watch or I, I don't believe so. Not not in its first generation. You know, even for Google's relationship with manufacturers like LG, 
I don't think we've seen them really figure out each individual piece of hardware to the same refinement. I mean, that that kind of manufacturing, that kind of acumen still requires the practical experience of putting, putting products out into the market and getting feedback on them. And I think the perfect example of that is looking at in one year, we've got Apple with AirPods going up against Pixel with Pixel Buds, Google with Pixel Buds, and one product feels significantly more refined, polished, and attractive than the other. Um, I, I, from what brief time I've spent with the Pixel Buds, I thought it was a, a disappointing experience considering the price tag affixed to those. I, I, I didn't care enough to be in the Pixel ecosystem on all fronts to, to pick that up. But I, I would have faith that a second generation Pixel Buds should show the same level of refinement that we saw going from the Pixel 1 to the Pixel 2. Now with Pixel 3, I think we'll have a much savvier competitor for the phone but we'll be looking at Google's first entrance into delivering their own watch. The buck stops with Google. We made it, not someone else made it. And we just kind of slapped a label on it. So I'll be curious. I'll be re really curious to see what this comes out with, because I think we're also in a holding pattern for the technology, a holding pattern yeah. for the technology. Uh, there are a number of issues that I've got with Wear. I don't think Wear OS has aged very gracefully uh, from Wear Android Wear 2.0 to Wear OS. Um, I, I can't say that the experience has really improved and I'm finding a lot of uh, bugs and, and studier, uh, stuttery performance on my Huawei watch. I, I, I think if we were talking about a significant process improvement to that chipset, like they got down to a 14 nanometer build as opposed to sticking with the 28 we'd be seeing some more uh, substantial improvements but i'm i'm very i'm very skeptical that this this pixel watch is going to be the direct apple watch competitor we've been hoping for it'll be the first step in creating a product line that eventually can compete but i don't think it's going to compete right out of the gate google has all the incentive to at least show competence in its platform and its hardware for this first generation and you might not have like, like i have made the argument before to uh the chagrin of many other people that uh google uh that android wear was not it was not being driven by google that was yeah. being driven by uh oems and to that point i mean you know in reference to its pixel phones and uh it's uh um pixel buds like how much agency google wants to put in to its efforts depends on how much it, it invests in hardware well, it, and software and and look at where we were with pixel 2 pixel 2 was an improvement over the first pixel but the initial launch was a little clumsy and google had to do a significant amount of pr work to kind of hide behind some of the manufacturing issues you know, uh, hide behind the main like LG on display performance, hide behind the HTC team on some of the uh, the smaller pixel build issues. It it on wasn't speaker, able... speakers and also just on support on uh, exactly. actual hardware support. So and so they weren't able to fully own that phone problems and all. Now, I have every confidence that Google has in iterative manufacturing has addressed some of those concerns that the pixel is going to be a better phone now than when it originally launched and that pixel three will be another iteration improvement on top of that. But I don't think we've seen Google really take the ball and run. I, I think they're still in this transitionary phase from we supply the software and other people make the hardware to we make this product. We own this. And we'll support it because we're the only name on the box that matters. So I think it's just a culture shift that's happening at Google, which we haven't seen them fully realize the potential of that complete ownership of the ecosystem. Yeah, everyone's uh, expressing their doubts in uh, uh, the hashtag PN Weekly on Twitter. Steve mm -hmm. Becker, uh, can Google fix Android Watch OS in time for the release date of the new watch? Uh, Peter Hayton, do you think the potential of such a watch from Google w could be the beginning of a new platform after Android Wear, given that it hasn't remained as competitive as had been intended? Or do you think that this will represent a relaunch of Android Wear um, I would say at the latter at this point, uh, there was some note of, um, Android Wear back in 2015. Mm. It was like, oh yeah, that was a uh, sort of cool. And then it 
it was I, I'm not sure if it was allowed to die out, but um it was or more it just dropped from the earth all of a sudden. Well, so and this is from yeah. Renato Laporte, PN Weekly. Google is too late with this Pixel Watch, like a year or two too late. Even the LG watches that Google sold on its website, that was an LG watch, not a Google watch with the special Google magic. And I think that lines up with where I I would hope um Google will go. And this is kind of in line with what Peter Hayton was asking. Do you think the potential of such a watch from Google could be the beginning of a new platform after Android Wear? When you changed the branding from Android Wear to Wear OS, you've got potential now to put an operating system into other things you wear. Maybe they're visual, maybe they're audio, maybe they're just tactile, maybe they're just a collection of sensors that communicate with other devices in a personal area network. I would love to see Wear OS be a complete from head to toe ecosystem of uh, polar strap style chest heart rate trackers and um, maybe uh, mechanical implements that can track hand movement for VR and AR applications, um, not just building a circle on your wrist that you look at with your eyes, but building sensors into your shoes, uh, building fibers into compression gear, workout clothing, so that you you not only get steps, but you actually get muscle activation and stretching information so that you can properly uh, adjust your workouts to, to be working out healthier, to, to focus on certain major muscle groups. I, I think moving, moving wear out of the notion of this is our smartwatch OS into this is our wearable technology ecosystem could be the perfect way to combat Apple and the Apple Watch. Because I, I don't believe Apple is going to have the, the resources, the ability to flesh out an ecosystem as quickly as Google could. And they could set the trend, especially like they've got relationships with clothing manufacturers. They had the smart jacket from Levi's. Uh, Google has those resources and they could capitalize on that with software custom built to interact with the body as a total organism, not just your eyes and fingers. And that would be a very clear and direct mission that I would like to see Google uh, publicly adopt for Android yeah. or Wear OS. Uh, but I'm sort of concerned uh, just by uh, the inclusion of Android things because you know, there there is that kind of Venn diagram overlap between what Wear OS and Android things might you know include yeah. in terms of products and if they get confused and and start to blur the lines in terms of that mission, then it, but, it might know, become all for naught. Isn't, isn't this what always breaks our heart, though, is being able to see some potential in all of the chaos is, you know, you've got Android things, but why not have things OS, Wear OS and Android, you know, like yeah. you could have these little modules that then express part of the ecosystem. So where is the operating system for stuff that's on your body? Things is the operating system that interacts with, you know, smart home IOT in your phone. And then you've got Android, which is sort of the brain that helps you manage all of the apps and services that coordinate with all of this stuff. I, like, again, I see that as being pretty clear potential. And it's something that Google at IO could have just led the discussion on, you know, we're, we're going to you know, draw a line in the sand. Now we're going to say this is our mission and we're going to lead this market. And we are the only company with all of the resources, the machine learning, the operating systems, the developers, the apps that can truly push body and home computing into the next generation of products and services. But I, I think they're still I think they're still licking their wounds from Google Glass. And I think they're going to be ridiculously conservative, which unfortunately means other players in the space will have huge opportunities to take them out. I think uh, you're right in that, and that the whole Google I.O. thing for them was that they've announced a whole bunch of stuff, but it felt like it was sort of flailing around as per usual, I guess. I mean, a lot of some well, of I mean, stuff that they announced yeah, at they, I.O. are because yeah. we're, we're, we're going to get to I.O. And, and, and to your point right there, I think you're absolutely right. There have been years where Google seems much more focused, but the last couple major announcements coming out of Google have felt fairly scattered. And there are some significant omissions that I think we should talk about when we talk about I.O. But we should probably let's just wrap up these next two stories really quick, because I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on either yeah. of these. But I'm going to go back into screen share here. 
So, uh, yeah, FCC uh, finally announcing uh, the due date for the f- repeal of net neutrality to take uh, full effect on June 11. Uh, 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 apparently, the Office of Budget and Management uh, finally got around to approving uh, some of the changes that need to be, needed to be made uh, to uh, the what was it? The Restoring Internet Freedom Order. Uh, so, yeah, um, there you go. June 11th. Well, and of course, it's not the end of the story because there is already a procedural or a procedural action in place for a committee review, which requires one additional vote from the GOP. It's got 49 Democrats, one independent. Um, and no, isn't it, Susan Collins? 40, 40, 49, 49 Democrats and an independent and the independent and one uh, a Republican. They just need one more Republican to force this committee uh, review. And then from there, that would pass to the House. And that's super unlikely that it'll get passed in the House. But if it, it would did, need two then... thirds, right? No, it, it's it, when this committee review is only uh, 51 uh, more than higher than it's 50 percent plus one vote. Um, okay. So you, you don't need to have the two thirds. It's not a bill. It's a committee review and then a committee repeal. And if it passes both the House and Senate, then it has to be signed by the president who can veto this this review action, too. So there's really no hope that the current implementation of the OIO, as it pertains to Title II regulation of the Internet, is going to be the open Internet order. Um, Yeah, the open Internet order. Sorry, I've I've been deep in the weeds on this for a while. Um, (laughs) I just feel like I'm I'm like broken record now because we are in a lot of bureaucratic, procedural, slow moving um, uh, congressional actions right now. But there's really no hope that the uh, the open Internet order as we know it is going to be preserved. But it forces a record vote on the GOP who are voting against net neutrality. And I think this will be one of those side tangent issues, which is going to be brought up during the uh, the midterms that these are the people who sold you out to major corporations who are going to make your internet services more expensive or throttle your connections. And, you know, the, it's overwhelmingly conservatives who seem to be against protecting this kind of uh, uh, consumer protection. So uh, it, it's it's still a moving target. Net neutrality is still on the books, even though we're pretty confident that this FCC is not enforcing any of, yeah. of that um, <laughs> regulation, but we're we're still in that phase where I think it's it's worth contacting your elected officials to say you know whether or not you support this because the conversation is still is still ongoing. The conversation is still happening, and I think the most important battles that will be fought will be again whether the federal government and the state governments that have supported exactly. uh, different uh, net neutrality legislation okay. of. Uh, yeah, who would have thought important. that we would flip flop in like one one presidential season for liberals now trumpeting states rights, states rights. rights. I like all those conservatives, man. They just seem to hate when states have control of, and their own autonomy and their own agency over how they want to conduct business. Well, so. it, they've supported <laughs> states' rights when it was convenient for them, or for supporting states' <laughs> rights no, I mean, when it's convenient that's, for us. That's what I think is hilarious: is playing politics on this. It only took it only took one trigger issue like this to completely flip. Uh, what the are principles? But... I don't know what <laughs> principles are, man. I love I really it. Don't. But um, I, I talked about this on on my own like YouTube stream uh, on Monday. But it was. Uh, it is really interesting to think that if California and New York are able to both pass the same net neutrality style protections, what they're looking to pass is even stricter than the open Internet order that the FCC would have uh, would have used for its Title II regulations. And it would represent one fifth of the population of the United States. So that would be a clear shot across the ISPs that are trying to uh, support gutting this type of regulation, which means that that fight is going to get phenomenally ugly between who has the authority as the FCC is trying to get rid of the authority to regulate the internet, but they're still going to try and supersede the states that are looking to regulate the internet. Again, the, the, the mind games that you have to play, the sort of 1984 doublespeak, 
that you have to engage in or double think that you have to engage in is is kind of hilarious at this point that uh that anyone's entertaining this as being a good idea is just really sad in the current state that we find ourselves with Rodney. well you talk about california and new york i mean california is the fifth i think uh fifth largest, largest economy, uh, in the world, yeah. economy in the world and new york is somewhere <laughs> that produces 1.5 trillion or something in gdp mm-hmm. so yeah i mean the, that's where business is that's where the internet is if anywhere is it, it's most needed then those are the places and those i think uh, are going to be pretty important uh, yeah, uh benchmarks and that's, and that's why i think the federal fight is going to get real ugly because this administration does not seem to react kindly to the uh the political moves made by those coastal elite states the coastal like elites California. but i mean the fact is business gets done there so i mean <laughs> right? unless you want to change your i don't know um let's uh I want to get away from this completely. Yeah. I want to put my phone in a different room so that you know, I don't I have to pay good, attention to it. That's a good idea. In in fact, I would I would probably say there's there's likely some scientific data to support your desire uh, to get away from your smartphone and use it less, and not only use it less, but keep it as far away from you as you possibly can. So uh, it, there was a study published last year in the Journal of the Association of for Consumer Research. Uh, a few of these uh, researchers are looking to see how the presence of a smartphone being with uh, you know, all the notifications you see, receive in the day and the phantom kind of uh, vibrations that you get in your pocket or your bag or whatever. Like you, you, we know that smartphones are taking uh, – a certain toll on our social behavior now what does this mean for our basic skills like cognition and and fluid intelligence well uh apparently if you put it on a desk it's a uh, pretty uh, i mean the the effects are there uh, there is a strong decrease in uh, certain testing uh for these uh, cognitive skills and uh, uh memory uh, mathematics, pattern, intuition, um, you do get an increase in impulse, which is, you know, you take the good for the bad of whatever that is. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there are certain effects to it. Uh, if you just even have it in the pocket or a bag, uh, it's still quite uh, a negative result there. So only when you start, you know, putting your phone in another room, do you see full attention skills, your full uh, abilities to process basic tasks uh, is uh, really at its best. Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's just so much information coming out on cognitive development for children as to what kind of exposure they should have to this type of uh, attention seeking technology. Uh, we, we still have a number of practical concerns when it comes to things like smartphones and automobiles, you know, operating uh, phone distracted driving campaigns. Um, we had a conversation on Pocket Now with uh, a clinical psychologist who uh, focuses on addictions, talking about how smartphones enable uh, different types of addictive uh, addictive situations. I had a conversation with an audiologist about uh, smartphones and hearing health, again, through the ability to overuse this style of technology. We, well, we are I'm not so sure if this fresh. correlation, I'm not sure if this correlation would surprise you, but it turns out that phone owners who have identified as more dependent and more emotionally attached to their phones, like uh, much like a parent to a baby's cry, uh, are more likely to draw extreme negative effects uh, in ter- or or extreme negative uh, uh, metrics in the tests that they have done. So oh no, and, and and I think we've had some 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 decent anecdotal examinations, especially singular and one off cases of individuals who have made claims about the emotional the emotional state, the emotional impact of utilizing this type of technology, but um, especially when I when I sat down and spoke with the audiologist at UCLA, I. This impact on our society is so aggressively fast. Think think about the differences in mobile computing today versus where we were 10 years ago versus where we were 20 years ago. 
and four comprehensive studies on the impacts of of a new technology. 20 years is not a long time to study and unravel the implications and the effects of this technology as the technology uh, uh, very aggressively iterates and evolves. So by the time you're done conducting your long-term study, the technology has changed dramatically from when you started doing your long-term study. And it's you're, you're kind of back to square one again with trying to focus on one specific aspect. And it's going to take us a long time to study each of these individual components, uh, addictive uh, behavior, sleep impact. And again, the science on sleep is horrific. Um, the Joe Rogan podcast just recently had a sleep scientist on and your, your, your ability to fight cancer. If, if you're not getting at least, at least seven hours of sleep a night, your ability to operate a motor vehicle, to fight cancer, to perform in your job functions. It's like everything is decimated and only 0.0001% of the population has a brain capable of sustaining prolonged work activities with less than six hours of sleep. Well, that's like, a huge 0.001% of the population. If you I, talk to certain people, <laughs> I mean, like so many people pride themselves on like, oh, I can do just fine on five hours of sleep. And you're like, yeah, but your, your risk of getting a terrible disease or of a coronary issue or some kind of brain problem are, are substantially uh, impacted by that. And we don't know the full effects of utilizing modern technology as it influences our sleep habits. And that's one data point, right? So we need to have studies on computers, TVs, laptops, cell phones in total in this digital lifestyle that we've created. And we need to look at that over a long period of time with a good sample size of a population just so that we can unravel that one point on sleep. And then we have to do that for every other aspect of health over probably two or three generations of people before we'll have a good handle on what's good and what's bad. This These early indicators are, are not looking super great for the way that our society currently consumes digital media, especially when on the go. Yeah, there is no placebo for that kind of thing, really. So uh, how, do you, how do you a... find a control group for something like that? I mean, the entire process by which we test this. I mean, so it's like we're going to have to increasingly rely like, uh, well, we took another 20 people from Amish country and <laughs> we're going to study their behavior again as a control group because they're the only people we know that don't have smartphones. <laughs> and even some of those Amish people are starting to have to adapt to the situations yeah. where they have to rely on, uh, you know, even ride sharing or like some, something like that. Uh, Steve Becker, uh, hashtag PN Weekly. I got to start leaving my phone in the fridge so that it always stays fresh, just like me. There was um there was like a really good urban legend like if your microwave is leaking radiation put your cell phone in the microwave and try and call it and if you can get a call through the microwave then it's not properly sealed and you're like I I don't think that's actually that's true. not how it works <laughs> I don't think that's how it works but yeah so I mean if it, it, again I I think we are I, I think I am the generation of people who discovered that food could be terrible for you my parents were of the generation that had just figured out that smoking wasn't just bad for you. It was awful for you. And then and your grand, thinking, grandparents are just finding out that labor conditions are actually <laughs> bad. And, you know, I mean, right. Like, well, maybe going. we shouldn't have three-year-olds in manufacturing, uh, in manufacturing economy. No, um, but, but moving forward, I think we'll be a transitionary generation that starts developing better habits, uh, best practices for how to more in, in a more healthy fashion, incorporate technology into our daily lifestyles. The, the last 10 years have just been an explosion of novelty. And now we've got a number of etiquette issues, health issues and society issues and legal issues to hammer out what the the best way forward will be for how we use these apps and services. And it's gonna be a long journey. And along the way, unfortunately, it means that some people will probably be impacted uh, by this, this technology in very negative ways. Information age, more like indoctrination age. Oh, snap. <laughs>
Uh, on that note, let's uh, move on to Google I.O. 2018. We have had uh, plenty of uh, topics to cover just from the keynote itself. Yeah. Uh, some other uh, conversations that we can have offline about uh, other features like Google Pay, which has had its own um, uh, improvements happen. But let's focus first on Android P. Uh, and I feel like we've come over this every single year mm -hmm. wi-fi battery big focus yep. is here um being able to track uh, the processes uh, that take up all the battery life that you have uh yep. yeah it's in the connectivity is just being so, able to connect to a network i i think from from oreo to whatever p is I, i've been calling it android pi in my head um and I keep waffling back and forth between Android PIE and Android PI. Um, I actually have been very positive because Google keeps saying, oh, and Android, we're, you know, this version of Android is going to run smoother and it's going to run more efficiently and you're going to see better battery life. And that never really fully comes to pass. But Oreo and especially 8.1. I've seen process improvements, stability, and uh, battery life improvements over running phones on uh, Nuga. Um, so I, I'm I'm willing to go with them forward because I like seeing Google get stricter with their initiatives, things like Project Trouble, and forcing manufacturers to play ball with updates, with bug fixes, with security patches. You know making manufacturers more responsible for that kind of stuff and delivering some really good benefits like killing background processes android getting much more brutal about what's allowed to run in the back of your phone um that kind of stuff i think is going to be a very positive step moving forward there are a couple other things too that i'd like to see though if if you're going to push phones with amoled screens and you're going to talk to us about battery life why not give us a dark theme you know, I yeah. it, it's the, it's going to be a very minimal <laughs> power save, but every little bit helps. And I hate, um, especially using my phone at night, even with the brightness all the way down and blinding white notification shades and settings menus is literally the worst. So it would be a huge step if you could finally give us the dark theme that's been buried in your developer previews since Android 5, Android 6, yeah. I think. I mean, it's something that everyone wants, and I don't think uh, Google has demonstrated a, a, a good reason for that to not really happen. But uh, maybe, I mean, we've seen more things on the app side in relation to night yeah. modes and such. But the Twitter really night mode is awesome. It's great. It looks phenomenal and it provides a very high contrast look which even in the middle of daylight in bright direct sun it's easier to read for me anyway it's easier for me to read light text on a dark background i don't get why google can't figure this out for their overall system settings when it's something that's appealed since um hollow theme you know the hollow theme on android devices uh windows phone uh, did this really really well and instead now we're going towards this let's use the most power we can from the screen just to show basic ui elements has never made any sense to me and it's something that i still think is a glaring hole in android's just general uh ui behavior I don't know. Whatever testing that they have done in terms of readability or or whatnot, and like just having black stuff as opposed to like a dark you know, accent and color, and how that would uh, affect their design guidelines or whatever. Like they have a lot of things to consider, and some of them trivial, some of them not so much. But so um, some, before we before on. we move on to the next IO story, this one's from uh, from OG Vinny Madrox on Twitter with the PN Weekly hashtag. I'm still trying to figure out how adaptive battery in Android P is different than Doze from last year in Oreo. And correct me if I'm way off base here, but it seems to me that adaptive battery is more of an evolutionary step for more aggressive background services control than what Doze was. If it I'm is. Not. I mean, it's a whole suite of things. And I mean, one of the, the, the cool things that I've seen a couple of OEMs, I can't recall their actual names, but uh, is that, you know, you know, when I'm going down at the end of the day at like 30% or so, it will, the, the, the phone will actually notify me that at this rate, you'll be, uh, uh, your phone will die out at 1230 a.m. 
and uh, would you like to turn on battery saver? Like it's you know, it's one of those. It's more disclosure and it's more being able to uh, fit in uh, certain uh, tailor the s parameters of the battery battery saving uh, mode and, uh, and such. So yeah, I sort of like what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, me too. Um, and and again, also sort of I I like it when. So this is like what I like about EMUI on Huawei phones. When Google starts pulling things that were that work really well in manufacturer skins and then just starts incorporating them into Android. And I think the next phase will be like better garbage collection, better predictive resource management, especially with AI units being built directly into coprocessors on our chipsets. Um, that I think will also go a long way towards uh, um, shoring up some of the holes that we still see in Android. Yeah, and I to uh, one of your big paradigms that you've always referenced in terms of uh, touch square get app. I see that there's more distribution in terms of uh, where that happens, and in terms of specific tasks like yeah. app actions. Where uh, I mean, developers all have all they have to do is uh, get in a actions XML uh, file, and they'll be able to. Um, you know, inserts uh, certain tasks like they want to get. Uh, if someone's searching up tickets uh, for Infinity War, they can get those tickets or watch the trailer on YouTube uh, on, or you know, get those tickets on Fandango or slices, uh, where actual tasks um, like uh, being able to book a ride on Lyft uh, to your home or to work, whether it's Line or or um, the uber excel or something like that like those things uh, are just accessible just by typing in okay here lift and then whatever the heck that you want to tap yeah. you tap so i mean those are nice uh, moves going on there uh now android p in terms of access is uh, is uh, changing up here because thanks in part to qualcomm which has a uh, upgraded its uh, board support packages for the Snapdragon 845, 636, and 660. Uh, we're seeing 11 uh, devices, uh, seven of them not Google OEMs, uh, participate in the Android P beta from this point, the public beta. So, uh, and some of them are from Oppo, some of them are from uh, Vivo, uh, OnePlus, uh, even Essential, which... Oh, I guess it's more um, of a credit to their own accord of being able to update uh, software quickly because they're, they're running the Snapdragon 835. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but yeah, this is a good news overall, I guess. Well, and and like a, another another data point towards those those system improvements that Google has been trying to showcase for several generations of Android, like reaching out to manufacturers and trying to make it easier for updates to happen. And now we're starting to see the fruits of that when we can see developer previews on more than just Nexus and Pixel devices. So uh, again, that that gives me a little confidence in some of these manufacturers. When even Essential Phone is on the list of manufacturers that are that are building their products in a way where it makes this type of software transition easier, the software support faster. Um, that's a huge step in the right direction because like Android N is still under 5% market adoption in the billions of cell phones out there running Android. Like Google... I think they made it up to uh double digits, but Android yeah. Oreo is still kind of is, is 5% and that's not good. So this is definitely oh, right, a good right, step. Sorry. Yeah. Going, going, yeah, you're right. Going from N to O, but, it, but it's still like, that's, that's not a great place to be again how quickly this stuff cycles, how quickly threats are detected, how many consumers get left out on the cold for basic support, let alone full operating system updates, to be able to see these tools immediately utilized for a developer preview. And hopefully that means we see similar interactions between Google and manufacturers for when the uh, the actual uh, update is ready, the named Pi, whatever the P name is, the named update is ready for... A general release would uh, give me a lot more confidence for Android moving forward. Yeah, and I'm also pretty uh, pleasantly surprised at how popular the Android One program has gone out. Uh, we just saw BQ, a European manufacturer, do a couple of new uh, devices as well, and Xiaomi's doing a couple of new devices reportedly, and it's, it's just spreading around. 
and I think there's good sauce to be taken that if even if uh, they're on lower powered or you know not necessarily the most fast tracked uh, development boards, you know they are still able to get fast direct uh, Google updates just for the fact that they are running fairly clean software. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, you know, all these steps that Google's taking might be seen as a closing of, uh, or the gilding of the lily, but uh, I think it's far past time that there's some competition between Google and Apple in delivering fast software updates as universally as possible. Truth. Very, very true. Now, uh, alongside some of those uh, operating system updates, uh, this this one I thought was just kind of a, a cute little moment in the actual I.O. keynote um, where they were talking about smartphones creating this culture of FOMO, fear of missing out. And so they're replacing they're, Google is trying to replace fear of missing out with the Jomo joy of missing out by introducing this dashboard, which tracks your behavior on your Android device, shows you what you're doing, how you're doing it, when you're doing it, and might be a data point for some consumers to alter their behavior if if they're not necessarily engaged in the healthiest relationship with their phone. Getting back to the story that we talked about um, in our news block, uh, this this kind of stuff I feel is is made with the best of intentions, but for the people who actually do care about their behavior with the phone, I think this is just going to stress them out that they're not getting their their steps in on their fitness tracker like they should be. They're not putting their phone down like they should be. And for the general mass population of people out there, this is something that they'll likely just ignore and continue using their phones the way that they always have. Yeah, they really have to get into the dashboard and set the app timer so that they and the 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 set up the notification, set up shush which uh, in reality is a pretty good idea. You just flip the phone over and uh, that's it. Do not disturb. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, well, it depends. I mean, if people are really that invested, they might actually dig in and figure it out. But then again, but this is also, <laughs> you know, again, I, I, I'll be curious to see what we can do in the technology space, which might actually impact consumer behavior. Um, th- there seems to be sort of just a, a momentum at play as to how people use this stuff. It, like I look at Facebook as being a perfect example of this. No one seems to like Facebook. Everyone seems to hate this service. It, it's, it's developed a really terrible reputation, but you know, it's where everyone else is. So I, I should keep my Facebook page too. Like there's just this weight of momentum keeping Facebook alive outside of the the numerous apps and services that they've acquired, like Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, you know, this is a nice gesture on Google's part, but I don't think that it'll move the needle on actually influencing consumer behavior. It's just something that's that's kind of neat for them to show off that they're making a good faith effort to give us the tools to alter our behavior. And I don't think that's really going to change anything. I don't think that's really Yeah, good. I think one thing that has been made clear is that Google will be Google. They will do the privacy uh, policies that they must. Uh, and if they come against uh, any opposition, it will be dealt with in court and they'll have to sort things out after that. So um, it, it's, it feels like, uh, you know, this is all data labor and it's all free on the part of, uh, you know, the companies just being able to grab it and uh, do with it as they wish. Uh, so um, I, I don't know how we change that um, dynamic, but it is uh, certainly one that has a lot of people worried. Yeah, definitely. Uh, moving right along. Oh, we already talked about that. Uh, my <laughs> my <laughs> stories are out of order. Sorry. Um, I, I wanted to touch on this one a little bit just because I think it's just such an interesting gimmick that seems to get people lit up. But it's the notion of utilizing celebrity voices on our on our gadgets and electronics. Now, the the well, main I mean, story- John Legend, like he shot his his uh, what was it his, the music video for some song uh, on the with pixel, the pixel two jc superstar i thought he was pretty good as, as jesus christ and jc superstar and my background yeah. in 
in theater production and dance. I uh, thought he did well. Um, but no, it, it's the big story is Google Assistant's going to get new voices. I, I think we've all had that experience on our phones where you've got this really great voice assistant thing happening. And then on Google Maps, you just take a random turn and something locks up and you get robot voice for two directions. And then it goes back to being normal again. So improvements there, I think, are really great. But again, they've got to showcase it by by utilizing you know a celebrity to get people excited and, and you know like this is something that we keep dipping our toe into and pulling back out like tom tom when you had all of the novelty voices for tom tom navigators and you could get yoda or an arnold schwarzenegger impersonator my favorite was john cleese where he would actually like if you're wondering this is really john cleese i can assure you it is because i need the money you know like it's hilarious <laughs> for your turn by turn navigation but there, um, there is an interesting Black Mirror issue at play here where that kind of celebrity voice sampling with new tools coming out, like uh, Adobe's ability to sonically capture someone's voice and recreate elements of that voice and make that voice say things that it didn't actually say. Um, we are pushing towards uh, how do we verify the truth how do we verify reality and for as neat and as fun and as lighthearted as this is that they can sample john's legend john legend's voice and use him as your google assistant voice it brings up a number of security political and uh news reporting uh situations that i think we're woefully unprepared to tackle right now yeah and i mean the moment that vocaloid gets uh acquired by google i mean it's it's going to be uh, one hell of a ride and we'll be all left behind in terms of uh, trying to catch up so well yeah, I mean, it's, have it's, you seen yeah. the adobe demo though I, th I think who is it is is it uh i've seen uh, other other demos of uh you know uh like donald trump uh like they even have the footage matched to the uh, speech pattern that he's using for a fake speech. Yeah, so, I mean, so, or, so or some or of those, and and th those still look really rough. Like there's the one with uh, pre uh, President Obama too, and and it yeah. There's enough uncanny valley, but the one that really freaked me out was the live stage demo Adobe did with Keegan, uh, Keegan Michael Key, and they just well, and you say this one sentence, and then we can cut this word out and put this word in, and completely change the meaning of what you said, and then and like. I know it's just a staged demo like that's polished under the best situation. Adobe is is showcasing the best. Uh, but how that process could function in a couple years based on a very limited swath of of audio sampling is 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 literally terrifying. Like that is ridiculously scary how much better that's going to be over the next couple of years. And and again, I'm, I'm sitting there watching Google I.O. like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, new voice assistants. Oh, John Legend, a celebrity. I'm watching them doing the recording. Then they do the sample um, output of John Legend. And you're like, oh, oh, this could be bad. <laughs> this could get real bad real fast. Well, I mean, if we could replace all of the Eurovision competitors, which is happening right now with... Uh all this this uh new voice technology then maybe that would be great i don't know maybe. um maybe. Maybe, maybe we wouldn't have a lot of fantastic lines or like uh uh that bearded lady that 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 won the thing one time right. anyways uh <laughs> let's talk about some of the other uh, the other google assistant features uh yeah. that are coming up like uh, continued conversations and mm -hmm. multiple actions uh this is all just realizing the context uh being able to hold a natural conversation not having to listen out for hey google every single time you're just able to talk back uh once you're done yeah, with and, one and question. apologies if, if you have your speakers on we just threw the hot word on your phone <laughs> hey google i hope you're wearing earphones hey google uh, let's subscribe to the pocket now weekly <laughs> wherever you can four phones just lit up on my desk <laughs> oh did, no what, what's all, the all result? it gave me were results but it did it did send them to stitcher so i i um, okay well i, I mean that's a good this. start <laughs> i could almost got us an extra subscriber <laughs> hashtag sponsored <laughs> Oh uh, boy. Hilarious. <laughs> Hilarious. Um kids will uh just like uh, with Alexa, they'll um there's a the pretty, pretty please, please mode. mode. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh door uh, 
d delivery, like connecting third party bots uh, via assistant for delivery services such as Domino's, 7 Elevens, Starbucks. All these, all these things are pretty nice. Uh, smart. We got an update on smart displays. Apparently, they'll be out in July or June, uh, and uh, more, more of that's uh, coming our way. And then there is a duplex, and uh, this is a kind of a new territory that we're going into here. Obviously, uh, when the demo happened, it wasn't a live demo, but it was recorded, and it sounded mm -hmm. like it was a pretty good. Uh, the 7,000 audience members at that uh, developer conference were kind of um, like standing up and cheering. And yeah, well, uh, it was an impressive demo. I mean, we know that this this is uh, using Google Assistant to actually communicate with people. It's using those voices, which we're yeah. we were talking about. Yeah. So, so your Google Assistant will go and make a phone call to a restaurant, to a car rental service, and will be your assistant. Will will tackle the communication with a living, breathing human being in a conversational fashion, even including ums and ahs as you know, those like sort of human markers in a conversation. Uh, well, yeah, we're looking for a table for seven around 3 PM, you know, like trying, trying to actually manage that. I, this is one of those, like, I really wished I, I was able to have seen uh, Jaime's response to this. Because he's been he's been so critical of voice assistants because he's like, well, they're not really my assistant. If I have, I'm trying to do my Honduran bravado right now. If I have an assistant, I tell my assistant, go and book travel for me or go and get a, a restaurant reservation or try and make sure that, you know, my hotel is taken care of. And I can't do anything with a voice assistant. And now it's looking like, holy, holy crap, like we're we're getting to that point radically fast. What What did you think of the creepy factor? Like. If you have Google Assistant making a restaurant reservation on your behalf, I feel the assistant should disclose up front that this human being is talking to a machine. Well, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that Google is trying to, uh, you know, incorporate as best possible. Uh, and uh, like, but in terms of, of all of that, like they're, they're working on that. They're working on um, future uh, applications. They're also, uh, but, one thing that I, I should note uh, from uh, the uh, chairman of the board at Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, is that uh, he says that this this whole duplex thing passes the Turing test, but only in terms of making a reservation. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't pass in general terms, but it passes in that domain, and that's really an indication of what's coming. And mm -hmm. given that all the stuff that we have mentioned before, I think you know, even without even with disclosure, even within the bounds of what Google is, uh, you know, is limiting this to at this point, I think for this is one of the few things that Google should um, uh, keep proprietary as best as possible, because who knows who else will get this hands on this thing if this becomes open source and. Uh, we start talking yeah, no, about I, I agree with you like google's actual actual implementation of this will hopefully be copyrighted and trademarked out the wazoo with an army of lawyers ready to defend it and that it stays proprietary to google internal technologies I, again for the privacy implications for the data collection the behavioral implications and just for this being another instance of technology interacting directly with human beings um i, I can only imagine other companies working on similar projects because you know google showing this means that it's gotten to a point where they feel comfortable showing it but that 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 means that there are probably an army of other startups and larger corporations that are working on similar styles of human technology interaction and just wait until you get a programmed voice ai or programmed voice bot that's all about robocalling for a campaign season you know, just just how much more effective and how much more weaponized that's going to be in spreading disinformation or um, trying to gin up controversies or uh, or just how obnoxious that poorer versions of this are going to be. You know, like when you try and call your bank or try and call your doctor's office to set up an appointment and they've gotten rid of their secretary because we've got this great voice assistant that works even better and is indefatigable and 24 seven. And you don't even need to have a, a person manning the phones as a job anymore. 
Um, but they don't have Google's tech and it's going to be terrible and we're all going to hate it. Um, we're going to be in for a number of startling uh, transitions like that. But tell me, like, Jules, that you didn't get to the end of that demo, especially the one where they call the uh, the Asian restaurant. And there's like this great, crazy miscommunication as to what they're trying to do. And they eventually still get to the desired result. But at some point, and very, very soon, I would imagine in the next couple of years that like my voice assistant's just going to be talking to other Google voice assistants, carrying out all of these business transactions for me. And I won't be involved in any of it. And eventually they'll let me know like just what I need to do. Like it's, it's, it's like we're already getting to that point of it'll be machines talking to machines. We won't even need to pretend that like calling people on the phone is a worthwhile activity. It's the personal concierge that we've always wanted. And until everyone connects their bots up to the main Google bot, uh, well, we're, we're still going to have to use phones and vocal communications in some ways, uh, you know, just outside of reservations and all. So, you know, and being able to, you know, express a clear, concise message at points where this is needed, then uh, we're working our way towards that. Until then, this is kind of uh, the stepping stone that sort of needs to be taken. Oh, and this is, uh, we've got a number of tweets on this using the PN Weekly hashtag, but this one, this is why I'm both excited and a little creeped out for this technology from uh, Renato Laporte, PN Weekly. If I have a business, I don't care who is booking to come and visit my place, be it a machine, a person, or a parrot, I don't care. But what I care about, Renato, is a major corporation like Google is using voice AI technologies to interact with other corporations and businesses who if they don't know they're talking to a machine then there is a problem with disclosure because i would have to believe just like with google voice and voice translation for my for your voicemails your voice your employee interacting with that voice assistant is probably being recorded analyzed dissected that interaction being compiled into a successful interaction or an unsuccessful interaction and that i do believe should require some kind of disclosure if I talk to a voice assistant and it's a nefarious or a bad actor and they take my voice, recordings of my voice, and they start analyzing that data or replicating that data, I should have some disclosure that, that something like that is occurring. Yeah, and just even by some of the scams, like one of them, you know, they ask a question right from the start of the call and they, you know, the recipient says yes. And then they, you know, use that clip of yes to basically you know have them somehow agree to with you know these <laughs> stupid contracts that uh yeah it's just it's stupid so and and it's been hilarious like the evolution of robocalls too because we, we're seeing a humongous uptick in robocall scams happening right now one of those that you just detailed this like we can record you saying yes and apply this to anything and you now have to fight it and prove that you didn't agree uh to this uh to this contractor to this arrangement um, but even just how annoying some of them are, where you pick up the phone and you hear the, hello? I'm sorry? Oh, I, hey, sorry about that. I think we just had a bad connection. Anyway, I want to talk to you about a reverse mortgage. And I, <laughs> ah, I can't hang up fast enough and block that number. Dang it. Yeah. Well, that stinks. Anyways, <laughs> would you like to move on? Yeah, we should probably wrap up these last couple of points here because we've got some Google Photos news and some Google Maps news. What do you want to hit? I think, uh, the, well, Google Photos, but if only for one thing, which is the uh, colorizing of black and white photos, because that I feel like has been it. Ted I've Turner, seen, uh, like a feature piece uh, about the art of colorizing these uh, black and white photos. It's not just you know. Um, you know, willy nilly, you use algorithms and stuff like you have to actually look into the film and you have to actually, you know, see the color space that was the uh, being able to achieve. Like, it, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and just to have this, you know, in the palm of our hands. I mean, it's one of those, well, it's one of those moments where it's, you know, it's like a it's interesting, you, you, yeah. No, I agree with you. Like, I, I'm I'm not super positive on this because I have a deep love of black and white photography. And I there's so many I know there's we are looking at old photos. It was a limitation of the time that people weren't shooting in color, but that also meant 
those early photographers were looking at how to compose their shots and balance light and contrast and exposure for the medium that they were working in. And I'm not particularly excited about the notion of just slapping some color on one of those photos in, in much the same way that I sort of, I, I disagree with altering films. You know, when George Lucas testified before Congress about what Ted Turner was trying to do in colorizing movies, and then George Lucas turns around and just kept re-editing Star Wars over and over and over again until it was a very different movie than what he set out to originally create. I feel that there should be some some respect of the preservation of what old media really resembled. That and I didn't even think that their example, the 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 photo that we just showed, if you were watching the YouTube stream of, you know, a woman and a kid on a bench, I don't even think that looks good. That looks like a terrible Instagram filter to me. And I didn't think it was a good example to showcase what Google was trying to accomplish by putting colorization tools into, into Google Photos. Like that that doesn't look good. That's not what I would want to show. And then you look at the black and white photo that they took it from, and that has character and it has a, a feel to it of the time that it was created. And this just looks like you put a sepia filter, you know, in Picasso. It doesn't it doesn't really, to me, <laughs> reflect like what what this should have looked like if it had been shot on film. So why are we playing this game? Why are we playing the why are we messing with this media? Um, already even like HDR tools, I find way too aggressive in juicing up photos more than they need to be. And now, now we can do the same to your black and white photos too. And you're like, no, I purposely shoot black and white when I want to capture the look or feel of something dramatic or high contrast. And, and I think we lose something when we alter our media that way. I guess part of that may be coming to uh, like coming from uh, the methods and being able to identify objects or and whatnot um and just, just assigning colors as opposed to the traditional kind of uh uh palette matching methods and whatnot so i mean uh, different products for you know different methods but uh, yeah no, as a uh, tech demo i think it's cool but this is actually going to be pushed into I, I think it's already rolling out um, to select handsets running uh, uh, using Google Photos. As a tech demo, I think what you're saying is really cool. You know, the ability for algorithms to scan a scene and apply information in a really novel way, not just, oh, well, you know, we, we made the grass green and, you know, uh, just added like a really bad color palette or a sepia palette or something like that. As an example of, of machine learning technology, I think that's cool. But as an actual consumer facing product I, I just I, it makes me sad like I go back and I, and I look at my old family photos and we have uh, black and white photos and film negatives and slides we actually had a slide camera my grandfather had a slide camera and so scanning all of those negatives and scanning all of those slides and uh, having really high quality digital archives of our uh, existing film and and slide archives is is really cool I don't look at those black and white photos and think, oh, but if only we could make them in color. Like, no, that's that's actually preserving my family's history. And I don't want to see family members just running off and like, oh, well, look, now we made like, you know, if you're a great, great grandmother, here's a an HDR, super colorful and pop. Oh, look at the reds on this. You know, like that's that that doesn't. That, that, that doesn't move. You me. don't. Well, it you don't like want you. you away. Well, you don't want to be able to at least see your, you know, relatives of that era in at least some sort of color. No, I'm not. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not interested in altering the the history of my family's media just because it's going to look kind of neat now when it's not even going to look good. <laughs> <laughs> like, again, I look at some of those old photos and, you know, like they, they haven't aged well. It wasn't like we kept our, our film negatives in archive quality um, uh, containers. What Google will do to those photos, I think, will look bad. And it's going to a lot of people are going to be convinced that that looks good just because it's novel and it's new and it's hip. Just like really super aggressive HDR looked interesting so people started to conflate that with this is good color for photography that's not true 
<laughs> it's just it's novel and it's fresh and it's exciting that you can do it as easily as you can. That doesn't necessarily mean you get a good photo. You just get a really colorful photo. It's like saying, you know, Sunny D is good for you because it's thicker <laughs> than orange juice and has more sugar. I that's not that's not what I want to see happen to media. It's it, you know like that's your opinion <laughs> no i mean no. you look at like the work of yeah. like an ansel adams and you're like would any of that photography be improved if we could slap color filters on it and no no because he was crafting an experience that was that that, that depended on the medium that he was creating it in uh th that that to me is what i feel we kind of lose when we make everything sort of the auto awesome approach green box everything's on the rails the computer does all the heavy lifting for you and you just generally vaguely point the camera in one direction with no technique and no examination and no quality discussion on what makes an image interesting we we lose out on this and now we're having all these tools on the back end to try and fix problems that don't really exist black and white images are not a problem and they look good and they they are of a time and they preserve a history so that that to me is is disappointing that it got as much play in the google photos discussion as it did yeah mohammed islam on the youtube chat uh leave my black and white photos alone they told a lot uh they took a lot of time to compose and it was done in one shot so um yeah definitely some concerns over there uh speaking of no technique no skill uh what about navigating because <laughs> i'm not sure how often you go underground and you take the subway but for the likes of me and jaime and the rest yeah. of us in new york and oh trust me york i wish i could do more of it but california is not really known for its public transit yeah, it's starting to and you know i might if i ever go there then i might have to rely on that as opposed to uber or or anyone anything else basically but God's um, God's i'll try visual positioning systems are c becoming a new thing for google just by using the camera google lens and identifying businesses as they uh pop up as you, you turn on your camera and you you come out of the subway and your gps is not really doing its thing you turn well there you go you spot a business over there oh now you realize that you're facing north instead of this general direction where or even you're even located at a place where you really aren't supposed to be like five blocks from here or something like that. So uh, it's a, it's a great improvement from, um, you know, having to be able to remember which direction, which orientation your train came out of and what the Northwest corner of the street is uh, designated as an exit of, or, you know, it's, it's better. It's great. I, like no, I think this is an excellent example of AR and machine learning improving something that that was kind of annoying. This wasn't like a tragic, I can't use this device, all utter failure of Google Maps and walking directions. It's, it, it's hilarious that every single time I'm in San Francisco, I do that thing where I have walking directions up after I get out of uh, I get off the BART and I start walking in one direction and it's almost a guarantee like 99% of the time I'm walking in the wrong direction and it takes a couple steps before, you know, Google maps catches up and points me in the right direction. Or it looks like you're walking backwards because it's telling the, you that you're facing one direction and walking exactly. in the other. Yeah. It, it, especially as the compass in our phone can, can get pretty confused. So instead of trying to, instead of trying to pry, into user information like we saw when Google got tagged for using people's Wi-Fi as um, place markers in Google Maps, AR and machine learning to analyze the scene with the incredible amount of data that Google has on location information and being able to match what you see with their archives of businesses and stores and streets and stuff like that. This to me is, is a significant consumer benefit that we can see from an early implementation of AR. And this is, this is exactly what I help we build the, the backbone on for future services. Cause imagine having just very simple arrow pop up heads up display tools for your car and being able to navigate that way off of, you know, a camera on the dome of your, of your hood, 
uh, looking at streets and locations and, and, and intersections and being able to better guide you through tricky uh, navigation situations. So this, this to me is, is a humongous step forward, which is in a very subtle fashion, the, the service that I hope to see iterate on for improvements moving forward. I'm just wondering when wearing AR headsets will be a socially acceptable thing in public. Yeah, still bummed about Vaunt, you know? Like, I would totally rock some hipster nerd glasses, you know, nerd frames, the big old Although I don't think they would be BC best frames. fit for this purpose because well, it, they're it. more intended to be out of the way than... No, but, but, but uh, I mean, like, heads what, up. What, what, what we're saying for that as an implementation Vaunt's was the first generation of this type of system that had actually made it into a functional prototype if we could have built off of that and and we could have learned from that and we didn't have to build in huge batteries because you have active powered displays instead of your instead you're using these little like laser projectors that can maybe also track you to different quadrants like maybe you do want to look up and to the right for a certain piece of information maybe you do want to project when you're looking straight ahead just a little arrow pops up into your field of view and it doesn't have to be super high res or you know well, not when you're looking at pop-ups or like fashion pieces and oh here's the look that uh is available at target right now do you want to buy it mm -hmm. you look at buy now and that's that and suddenly you have it in your hands or you're looking at a YouTube video superimposed in front of something that you just searched up from looking at this like brick wall or something and Pink Floyd starts popping up. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I just mean like Vaunt was the first step in what could have been the perfect solution for how twitchy people are about having funky goggles or Google Glass Borg screens and you know like face computing in general and it's just it just sucks because that could have been a really discreet way to handle all this but this is what's exciting about the service moving forward google maps actually improving there i i hope that we see some some better refinement because i've actually personally been having a lot of problems with google maps on phones that have been updated to oreo um it's been running really flaky for me trying to get around la which has been a bummer so i'd like to see that just you know, get some new features. And now that we see some new features, uh, Google Lens is going to be coming to a handful of phones over the next week. Um, I'm going to be playing with it on the G7, hopefully next week, and maybe share some thoughts on that as I walk around LA. Um, that uh, that kind of improvement. Then now that we have the new features, what I hope to see is that we'll get back to a couple iterations on just fixing bugs and uh, improving stability. Yeah. Yeah. And we hope that all these features, uh, be it Android P or uh, all these other services that Google's offering right now, get those improvements and uh, maybe not. We don't have to wait until the next year for yeah. certain little features to pop up and, you know, It'd improve be nice. our lives. I'm just saying, Google. I'm just saying. Well, um, on that, I, I think we've uh, we've covered quite a bit of what we, what went down. Uh, obviously, if you think we uh, we missed anything, I hope you'll reach out and drop us a line. Uh, hit us up on the emails, uh, podcast at pocketnow.com, where we'll collect uh, a, a handful of messages at the end of the month. Do a listener mailbag uh, reply, especially for your comments, your questions, and uh, anything else you guys want to talk about. And uh, there you have it, folks. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where Jules is at Point Jules, and I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and our home sites, pocketnow.com and es.pocketnow.com for Spanish speakers. Shows like this cannot exist without your support. Sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology and dropping reviews anywhere you can review a podcast help get some new eyes and ears on the show. We greatly appreciate it. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, Stitcher Premium, a wonderful resource for high quality podcasts like ours. Uh, they're helping us keep the lights on here, but ultimately there would not be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness so make sure you tune back in <laughs>